Welcome, everyone. It's so wonderful to have all of you here for the inaugural Nate Geller Memorial Lecture. My name is Ami Eden, and I am the CEO and executive editor of 70 Faces Media, the largest and most diverse Jewish media company in North America. Our brands include the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, My Jewish Learning, Feller, Hey Alma, The Nosher, and The New York Jewish Week. Nate Geller was a beloved member of the 70 Faces Media team and deeply dedicated to our mission to connect as many people as possible to all sides of the unfolding Jewish story. I want to thank his wife, Lynn, and his children for allowing us to honor this, honor Nate, um, to have the privilege of honoring Nate in this way. Um, you can learn some more about him um, in the um, obituary that we published um, that um, we're going to put in the chat so you can learn more about Nate there. I will just say, um, I think when you read it, you'll see he was not only a, a treasure for those who were able to work with him in 70 Faces Media, but was really a true servant of the Jewish community um, who loved the Jewish people. He, he loved Jewish learning and he loved Israel. And, um, and the way he chose to do that, um, to, to, to serve was to um, do the holy work of raising money for so many, you know, for so many different um, great organization and causes um, and making the work of so many other people possible. Um, so in that spirit, you know, I, I would also, um, uh, you know, we want to honor Nate not only with um, not only with a, a topic that he would be so happy with, but also um, to kind of live up to what he would say, which is like, don't be shy about asking all of you. Um, if you were here, that's what he would be doing is asking you to support the, the really great work of, of so many people on the, on the 70 Faces Media team who are doing so much to impact so many um, Jewish lives um, and, and Jewish community and Jewish families and, and Jewish learning. So, um, you know, we'll have a link, I think, in the, in the chat if you are, are so moved. Um, we we deep, we'd deeply appreciate it. Um, and with that, I'll just say, I, like I said, I think Nate would be really, really happy to know um, that this first lecture is in, me in his memory is being dedicated, um, you know, is, is, is to host a, you know, really loving and probing um, conversation about Israel on the occasion of its 75th birthday. I know he'd be thrilled to know that the, our two featured participants are um, Felissa Kramer, the editor-in-chief of our own news brand, the JTA, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, and to have her in dialogue um, with Daniel Gordas, who's been such a um, an important and provocative and interesting voice about, you know, always like um, putting Israel and its meaning for the Jewish people in Israel and around the world in America in the center. I, I, know, I know that he'd be really, um, really happy to know that this is how, how we were um, honoring him this year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Felissa. And again, thank you everyone for, for being here. We'll get there one sec, sorry. Thank you, I've been silenced. Um, thank you, Ami, for the, for the introduction. And before we jump in, I just wanna add one note of my own about Nate, who I overlapped with only briefly when I came to JTA, but, um, you know, his, his legacy is very strong and I think, um, you know, discussed frequently and, and we all understand that Nate really believed, as we all do, that tough conversations are a way that we um, help ourselves build strong Jewish communities. And so I'm really deeply honored to be, to be leading this conversation um, in his name. And I'm excited to dig in with you um, in just a moment, Daniel. So just so everyone knows, I'm guessing folks here do know, uh, Daniel Gordis is the Corat Distinguished Fellow at Shalem College, Israel's first liberal arts college, as well as 
the author of now 13 books, probably almost 14 is my guess, um, uh, uh, mostly but not all about Israel, two of which have won the National Jewish Book Award, several other finalists. If you have been paying attention to uh, debate and discussion about Israel over the past many decades, you have probably encountered Daniel's ideas, even if you don't know know it. Um, and so I'm very honored to be, to be talking to you today. Um, and so just to kick things off, um, I'd love to give you the opportunity. I'll, I'll hold up your newest book, um, Impossible Takes Longer, 75 Years After Its Creation, Has Israel Fulfilled Its Founders' Dreams? I'd love to give you a moment just to kind of explain um, why this book, why now, um, and and help us understand what that impossible is that you're talking about. Take things away. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you, Felissa, for the introduction and for having me. I'm really looking forward to being in conversation with you. I also want to thank Theo Wieseltier, who was the person who I think came up with the idea of my being involved uh, tonight for me, today for you. So I want to thank Thea for that also. And uh, though I did not have the privilege of knowing Nate, I did in advance of tonight read as much as I could find about him clearly an extraordinary human being. And so to play uh, even a small role in honoring his memory is a, is a great honor for me. And um, I'm, I'm very honored to, to be part of that. Um, <clears throat> why this book now? Basically, what I wanted to try to do with this book was to elevate the conversation about Israel. My experience has been, and specifically to elevate it, of course, as we were reaching 75 years of independence, uh, the prime minister did not check with me as to whether or not a judicial reform crisis would be good or bad for sales. So uh, we just kind of charged ahead anyway. We can talk about that down the road if you want. But um, basically, the, my sense has been over the years that the conversation about Israel, especially among North Americans, tends to get stuck in a number of very obvious and important issues. One of them is the, the conflict with the Palestinians. Uh, another one is the attitude towards non-Orthodox Jews on the part of Israelis, the chief rabbinate, the institution, the government, etc. Those are really critical issues. And I think that anybody who cares about Israeli society has to acknowledge that those are critical moral issues that need to be addressed because they are going to shape a tremendous amount about what Israel becomes. But if I was going to use an analogy to America, I would say that the gun problem uh, and the race issue are huge issues in America that have huge moral implications. And they will also shape what America will become over the course of the next decades, half a century or whatever. But they're not all that America is. And that one, one can have a conversation about the dream that America was and the way in which America has and has not fulfilled that dream beyond those two issues, as critical as they are and as morally valent as they are. And I was trying to do the same thing in this book, basically to ask, first of all, what was the purpose of the creation of the state? And in order to do that, I use as a kind of a spine in the book, the Declaration of Independence. I think everybody knows exactly what the Declaration looks like, because it's got such a unique look to it. Uh, but most people who know what it looks like have actually never read the 19 paragraphs that are in it. I would include most Israelis in that too. I would include 90% of Israelis, although maybe in the last few months, some of them have actually gone online and read the thing. But um, so I was trying to basically engender a new kind of a conversation where we ask, why did the Jews create a state? What was the state supposed to accomplish? Uh, and to look both at the tremendous accomplishments, but at also at the warts, blemishes and failures and missteps to have a serious conversation about a country which I think is an extraordinary success in many ways and highly and heartbreakingly imperfect in many other ways. And so what and what is the the thing that is impossible and taking so long? Well, I think the thing that's impossible is what we wanted to try to create was some sort of an ideal society. We wanted to take the values that were at the heart of the Jewish tradition and bring them to bear on this uh, very modern enterprise called a nation state. Now look, in a lot of ways, Israel's been unbelievably successful. If the purpose of the state, which I argue that it was in the book, was to create a new Jew, to fashion a Jew who did not live like the Jews in Europe live, to fashion a Jew who was not looking over her left shoulder or her right shoulder, wondering where the next attack was gonna come from, to, fo to foster a kind of a Jewishness where Jewish communities were not wondering when the invitation to reside in that country was gonna run out. 
We all know it ran out in England in 1290. It ran out in Spain in 1492. It ran out in Eastern Europe, all over the place we know. Um, if, if you're trying to create a new Jew, a new Jew who could defend herself, defend himself, uh, create a thriving culture, restore Jewishness to the peak and the pinnacle of the international marketplace of ideas and culture and music and literature, in all of those ways, Israel's been enormously successful, overwhelmingly successful. But uh, there are many things that are not perfected, to put it very, very mildly. I mean, obviously, the conflict is an enormous one. Um, there are, I think, if there, we can say this more of late than ever before, Ironically, the Jewish state, I think, was actually created, and I'm going to say this in a very kind of a, uh, an edgy way on purpose, I think the Jewish state was created to save the Jewish people from Judaism. That's really what the secular Zionists who founded this country thought. They thought that the Jewish people was terrifically important because um, it had a lot of things to say, but that Judaism, especially its religious variety, uh, had poisoned the Jew, had made the Jew weak, had made the Jew passive, had made the Jew unworldly, and they were going to save the Jewish people from the Jewish religion. Uh, to a certain extent, ironically, Israel did that, and to a certain extent, it did not, and in many healthy ways, it did not. Religion has proved much more persistent in the lives of Israelis than I think its founders would have liked, although I actually think that's a very good thing. What I think we have to acknowledge, though, is that the state that was designed to save the Jewish people from the Jewish religion has also spawned a, a very ugly version of the Jewish religion. Um, some of it's actually unfolding tonight, right now, at this very minute in Jerusalem, where there's a big flag march uh, for Jerusalem Day. And in, provocatively, going through the Muslim quarter, uh, there has already been a small amount of, not violence, but just, you know, altercations and, and whatever. Uh, it's a, it's a, to me, I'm my own, my own view, it's a, it, that's a, that's a, a, a version of the Jewish tradition that we don't need. That's anathema. Um, so there's a conflict. There are varieties of Judaism that are that are are not to my taste, to put it very mildly. There's all sorts of other failures. I mean, we could list them for hours, but you know, why do a third of Holocaust survivors in Israel live under the poverty line? What's that about? We're not even talking about that many people anymore. So to take care of them with a little bit of money would amount to nothing. What's that about deep down? Why are Israelis so conflicted about the Holocaust? Um, why is our attitude to non-Orthodox Jews as a state, not everybody here, but as a state and as an institution, why is it so deplorable in my honest, you know, in my in my view? Uh, why are we so conflicted about the, the persistent existence of a diaspora? Um, in many respects, the early founding fathers of Zionism thought as soon as the state's created, everybody's going to come over. And to whatever extent people didn't come over, that was either their failure or the failure of the state. I definitely don't see it that way, but what has what has boiled down, what is filtered down uh, from all of that is we have a very complex relationship with diaspora Jewry. So we have complex relationships with Holocaust survivors. We have complex relationships with Palestinians. We have complex relationships with all different kinds of Jews. We have complex relationship with the diaspora. And now as we're seeing in this whole new protest movement, we have complex relationships between Ashkenazim and Mizrahim. Uh, between people who want to change the way the court works, people that don't want to change the court works, the way the court works. Uh, those are all huge imperfections, some of them greater, some of them lesser, uh, but that's impossible. And I hope that we, I think the idea is not to get there, uh, but the idea is to keep striving. And if anything, I would just say as a conclusion to this, that what I've seen here in the last 19 weeks or so of protests is the degree to which young Israelis, secular Israelis, young Tel Aviv techie secular Israelis, care deeply about the vision of this country, the, the rumor or the sense that, you know, it was their grandparents that were the Zionist passionate ideologues and all they want to do now is code, go public, have exits. That's not true. They care very deeply about this place. And I think we've seen that over the last few months, which is an extraordinarily wonderful thing. So those are some of the impossibles. Thank you. And I, I noticed everybody um, kind of saying where they're, where they're, listening from. Thank you for doing that. It's great to see people from all over the world really here. Um, you can feel free to um, drop questions and later in the in the conversation, you know, we'll draw from those questions. So please um, keep up the conversation. I guess, um, I guess I'm curious to hear from you. This is kind of a little alternate history. It's a dangerous game, but, um, but one I think we're thinking through, is there a scenario in which um, the founders uh, you know, put forward their vision in the in the Declaration of Independence and Jewish. There is Jewish sovereignty in the land, and we don't have a flag march the way that's taking place today. Is that 
Was that ever possible? Yeah, I mean, it's, we know it's possible because it happened. In other words, in the first years after the Six Day War, um, on the anniversary of the unification of Jerusalem, there was always a, there was always a parade. There was always a parade of flags, but it was really a parade about um, the unification of an ancient Jewish city, the victory in the Six Day War. Um, it was about the best the best part of Israel. It was about a love of an ancient land, and so on and so forth. Over the course of years, and it's a very complicated process. Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day, has been more or less abandoned by rank and file Israelis and taken up by the right, the, secular, the, the settler movement. And I'm going to distinguish, these are not the same thing. The settler movement on the one hand and rabid racist anti-Arab sentiment on the other. They are not the same thing. There might be some overlap, but it's very important to be clear. They're not the same thing. Uh, but we abdicated that space. Uh, you know, that happens in a lot of societies. In American society, the, the symbol of the flag has been more or less abdicated to the right. Uh, you would not see a left-wing protest in America with lots of American flags being carried around, which is tragic because the left ought to be just as committed to the greatness of America as the right is. Um, and in Israel, by the way, the flag had for a very long time become a symbol of the right, very specifically a symbol of the settler movement. And one of the amazing things that's happened over the last four or five months is that it's been taken back by the left and the center and the liberal part of the right. But yeah, for many years, we had a, we had a, a flag march uh, in Jerusalem. I don't know if there were flags. I mean, I actually can't say that I know for a fact that there were flags, but there were certainly celebrations of Jerusalem Day. It was very common to, we did this as to college students, you know, back Back in the day, I think Abraham Lincoln was president. But nonetheless, you know, I mean, we did it. We would walk around the whole periphery of the old city. We did it on our junior year abroad. It was very fun. It was really wonderful. And there was nothing in the least bit hostile or provocative about it. We just did it. Um, but over the course of time, um, it has taken on a kind of a highly nationalist, somewhat hostile uh, aura about it. But yeah, we know that it could happen because it did happen. Whether we can go back to it now, of course, is a whole other issue. But, you know, that's... We'll see where we go. Um, and if anybody here who's from 70 Faces is able to drop stories, we did have a story about kind of the way that the, the symbolism of the flag is shifting and the reclamation of the flag as a symbol for all Israelis um, that I thought was really fascinating reporting from the ground. Um, so we've also published a piece, and I, I've seen, I know that you've discussed in other places, um, this 75-year threshold that we don't have a history of Jewish sovereignty lasting longer than it has. Um, and something happened the last two times we tried right at this exact moment. Um, and, and, you know, we were, we were the own, we were our own worst enemy um, at times. And I'm curious to hear from you about that threshold and, and how that's weighing on you right now. Yeah, Phyllis, that's a great, it's a great question. It's a painful question. Um, so a, a bunch of months ago, long before, you know, in a land far away, before judicial reform, um, I just wrote a piece on my Substack. I don't know why I wrote it, just, you know, came to me. And I wrote about the fact that the first time that we were sovereign, we lasted 73 years. And the second time we were sovereign, we lasted 74 years. A little bit of that depends on, by the way, on how you define sovereignty. Uh, just because you, we were sovereign and unified, I wrote. Um, and now we were, when I wrote it, we were in our 74th year. And a lot of Israeli writers, especially in the Hebrew press, were beginning to sort of get very nervous. Um, there were a lot of people like Asaf Inbari and many others who were writing about this and talking about it. And why did we fail both of those times? We failed primarily because of splits internally. And, um, you know, I, so when I wrote the piece first, and I know you guys have published about this also, and, and everybody has. It's just sort of, you know, it begs to be commented on. It just It just does. Um, I actually thought it was a curiosity. You know, I thought, okay, the first time was 73, second time was 74, we're about to celebrate 75, but look at us. I mean, we're not doing too bad. Um, I would say that was phase one. Like, here's a curiosity, we should think about it going into the 75th, and let's be sure we don't do that again. And then, you know, go to sleep and it's going to be fine. So, uh, so it was you. Excuse me? You brought, it was you who, who uh, put the idea out there. Well, I think it was, it was. There were other people. There were other people. No, no, well. I, 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 I meant that you were you were tempting tempting fate there. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. But, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it was me that caused it. Yeah, that. Well, you would not be the first person to accuse me of having destroyed this place. But that's beside the point. But um, I would say the second phase for me was when the whole judicial reform thing started. Uh, I was really despondent. 
I, I was literally despondent. And um, like many of my colleagues and like many of my students, literally not sleeping at night, just waking up in the middle of the night with some horrible foreboding, um, waking up in the morning and realizing that I was already thinking about it. And if we were having this conversation four months ago, I would have said to you, you know, I'm despondent, heartbroken, look what we're doing all over again. It's exactly the same story. We rip ourselves to shreds. We invite people to come in. So if the first time it was the Babylonians and the second time it was the Romans, well, this time, you know, I mean, Iran doesn't even have to get a nuclear weapon if we just rip ourselves to shreds and we, we just fall apart. We can save them the scientific research. Um, but I have to say that I'm in a different place now. I, I've been very buoyed and very... Um, very um, encouraged and inspired, actually, by what's happened here in the last 19 weeks of these protests. And, and, you know, there's a lot to say about them. You've already pointed quite rightly to the symbol of the flag having been recaptured by, by the, it's really not left and right. It is very important not to frame this as a left-right issue, because it's really not a left-right issue. There are a lot of people on the right who are completely opposed to the judicial reforms. It's pro-reform, anti-reform, and why people might be pro-reform uh, there's a lot of different reasons. The Haredim want to get one one vote, one law passed, which is that their sons will not go to the army. That's their one. That's their one vote. Um, Bibi Netanyahu has his own judicial agenda because he's been in, he's facing three indictments, and as long as he's prime minister, he can't be uh, convicted and jailed. Uh, there are other people on the West Bank, for example, who want the Supreme Court weakened because they think the Supreme Court has been anti-settlement, which, by the way, it is not. But um, it has been anti-building on private Palestinian land. There it's been consistent, because that's the law. Um, but nonetheless, but they think that the Supreme Court's been anti. But those are specific, those are specific groups, and they may be they're anti, they, they come together as a kind of an anti, anti-reform group, but they're not doesn't make the, the right is not there. The right is not left to right issue. But I would say what's happened in the last two or three months is we have seen. And I've read about this, so I'll just use my I'll, I'll use the phrase that I've used before. I think we've seen an explosion of love for this country. We've just seen the flag as a sign of an embrace. Uh, so you go to people's houses now, and what do you see behind their door when you walk in the front door? Do you see their flag on the pole? You know, in the winter time, we normally see umbrellas in those kinds of places, or uh, you know, whatever. But you go into people's houses, everybody's got a flag behind their door because every Saturday night we would much rather, you know be in sweats and watching Netflix, but we feel that we we can't. We just don't have that option. Our kids, when they were 18, did not have the luxury of going off to college. They were told to do something else. And I feel if those kids, if our kids did that for all those years, well, yeah, we just don't get this. We don't get to watch Netflix on Saturday night. The way the flag has been re-embraced, the way that these protests are filled with um, religious people and secular people and young people and old people and immigrants and natives. And there's nothing hostile in the air at these protests, nothing. There is hostility towards the reform, perhaps, but with people of all different sorts at each other. You know, one of my favorite signs at the protests, it start, it's, a new, it's a newer sign. The signs are themselves a fascinating study. Um, but one of the newer signs says demokratia, which obviously means democracy. That's the only word on the sign. But it's written in the font of a Torah scroll. Which is all you have to say. Everybody knows what a Torah scroll font looks like in Israel. So even if they haven't actually <laughs> seen a Torah, they know what the font looks like. And so when you put up a sign like that that says Demokratia, but with that font, what you're saying is there's no conflict here between, between democracy and religion, between secular Western values and Jewish values. They go together fine. And I think that this uh, exploration of this is actually really fascinating. And hopefully what we can do after this immediate judicial issue was put behind us is begin to have the national conversation that we put off 75 years ago because the founders of the country felt talking about a constitution was a luxury they didn't have in the middle of a war of independence. And now we have to have that conversation. And I'm hoping that what comes out of this will be exactly that, but time will tell. So I don't want to get your views wrong, but I'm struck hearing you um, describe the protesters seemingly able to assimilate, uh, you know, Democratic values and Jewish values, or that Jewish existed, Jew, you know, Jewish tradition. That that seems easy. It's, um, and I and I think that your book says, and I think you've made the case before, and certainly many people have made the case before, that that's really not so natural, and that there is an inherent tension um, that you know maybe hasn't been acknowledged to the extent that um, it should be, or or has been wished away by some, including many American Jews who want to see their own 
vision of democracy, um, their own version of democracy playing out in Israel. Uh, has this moment changed the way you think about that tension? Is that tension different from how you used to think about it? I, I think that when it comes to the um, the apparatus of Western democracy, meaning different branches of government and checks and balances and a court that can rein in a legislature, um, et cetera, et cetera, I don't see any conflict between that and Judaism. I, I just don't see any at all. And I think that when you go to the protests and you see real, you know, real Orthodox rabbis, not Orthodox light, as we like to say in Israel, but, you know, the real McCoy with the long beards and the whole shebang. And they get up and they talk about how what we need is a Supreme Court that's powerful because it's the Supreme Court that does exactly what Isaiah and Hosea and Amos said we should do. Protect the widow, protect the orphan, protect the stranger, protect the poor. In other words, what the Supreme Court always does is it protects the weaker parts of society from the potential excesses of a legislative branch. I don't see any conflict there between liberal democratic values and the values of the Jewish tradition. I mean, the, the value of the Jewish tradition says nothing about democracy. Obviously, it's not. It's 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 it's, it's a modern notion. I think that the larger issue of whether Israel should be a, a democracy or a Jewish state, leaving judicial reform entirely aside, look, that is that is a very complex issue. And it's, 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 I think, in certain ways, even more complex for American Jews in some ways than it might be for Israeli Jews. Uh, but look, if you, have a, if you have a public square that is palpably Jewish and you want it to remain palpably Jewish, then the question becomes, what are, is the mechanism for ensuring the palpably Jewish na nature of the public square? Uh, that's why people say, yeah, there needs to actually still be a rabbinate. May not be this rabbinate, right? And we didn't always have a Haredi rabbinate. We had, you know, Rabbi Shlomo Goren, who was a very much a non Haredi, uh, a non Haredi chief rabbi. We had uh, Isaac Herzog, not the president Isaac, Her not the current president Isaac, Her but his grandfather Isaac Herzog, who was the first Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Israel. Uh, yeah, you can call him whatever you want to call him in terms of what group he fit into, but unbelievably embracing of all different kinds of Jews um, in, in a fascinating response that he wrote, especially towards the beginning of the country when there was questions of who could be admitted and who could not under the law of return, all of that. Uh, so I think that there are tensions. I'll give you an example of one of one tension. Uh, just, to, you know, I think it, it's, it's instructive specifically for a North American conversation. Um, we all know that the Mizrahi population in Israel was not treated the way that it should have been in the early decades. I mean, Ben Gurion made no secret that he thought that they were basically culture free and, 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 you know, he did not want them dragging down the level of Ashkenazi kids in schools. Ben Gurion actually even toyed with the idea of separate schools for Ashkenazim and Mizrahim. I mean, thank God he never even tried to make that happen because that would have been appalling in countless ways. But the attitude prevailed. The attitude definitely prevailed. And I'm not talking now about the Yemenites and the disappearance of children. I'm not talking about Ethiopians. Those are all different. I'm talking about the general Mizrahi population that came in the early 50s when they were more or less thrown out of North Africa because of Israel's conflict with the, with the Arab world. Um, they were treated terribly. And they were an underclass, just like every democracy in the world has an underclass. They were an underclass. Now, here's the rub. We have made a tremendous amount of progress with the Mizrahi population. Tremendous. There are Mizrahim on the Supreme Court. There are Mizrahim in the faculties of all the universities. Um, weddings, but when I was writing my previous book, The History of Israel, I called somebody in the Ministry of the Interior to find out what's the percentage of marriages now that are between Ashkenazim and Mizrahim. And I, it took a long time to find the right guy. Uh, and I finally got him on the phone and I, I told him my question. He's like, well, how the hell should I know? And I said, well, what do you mean, how the hell should you know? You're like the guy in the Ministry of the Interior who does all the statistics. And I remember his line. He said, well, how many blue-eyed people in America marry brown-eyed people? Who knows? Who cares? He said, it's just so uninteresting at this point that we don't even have any data on that. That's a fabulous thing that you can't get the data on it. Um, but here's the rub. What civil rights means is that people get the, the rights and the privileges that they are owed, and they get to be the people that they want to be. The Mizrahi world is very traditional in its religious orientation. It is not egalitarian when it comes to gender roles. It is not open to non-Orthodox varieties of Judaism because that's not what they come from. They just come from a world, don't forget, non-Orthodox Judaism is a fundamentally European phenomenon. 
Reform Judaism starts in Europe. Conservative Judaism starts in Europe. They, they move to America and they morph in America, but they're fundamentally European phenomena in a whole array of ways. They never made their way into North Africa. They haven't made their way into Mizrahi Judaism. If we're going to give Mizrahi Jews the voice and the rights that they deserve, and I think they deserve, we also have to understand that they are not going to see Judaism in this state the way that maybe you or I do. My, my religious preferences and your religious preferences, I don't know what they are, but I'm just guessing for a second, you know, are not, are not what their preferences are. And I can't have it both ways. I can't say, yeah, I want you to have a voice in Israel as long as your voice says what I want your voice to say. That's not, that's not civil rights. Um, so I think that, for example, if we as Americans, I'm going to put myself in the American boat for a sec, um, want to celebrate the tremendous amount of progress that's been made with the Mizrahim, and I think we should celebrate it. I think it's an unbelievable story. We also have to recognize that with their making their way into Israeli society, their views are going to be heard more, and they may not believe what I want to believe. Um, and so I think there are going to be, mo there's a notion, there's a, t there's a tension also, which I, maybe what you were alluding to before, Israel's not a liberal democracy. Israel's not a, uh, a, you know, a falafel-eating, Hebrew-speaking version of the United States, just a lot smaller in a lousy neighborhood. That's not what Israel is. Israel is what's called an ethnic democracy, meaning that all of its citizens have the same rights. And like in every democracy, by the way, including America and France and Germany and so forth, sometimes that's actually actualized and sometimes it's in the law, but it's not in reality the case. That's, that's true here. It's, it's true here too. And we have a lot of work to do there. But in America... You know, if we go back, if we go 50 years from now, when we say, okay, America is mostly whatever you want to say, mostly Asian, mostly Hispanic, mostly black, whatever you want to say, and therefore Congress is mostly Asian, Hispanic, or black, and therefore the president is Asian or Hispanic or black, etc. Is that a failure or a success of American democracy? Well, obviously, it's a success of American democracy. That's what America should be. Uh, but what if 50 years from now, Israel is mostly Arab, and therefore the Knesset is mostly Arab, and the prime minister is an Arab? Is that a failure or a success of Israeli democracy? That's more complicated. It's a success of the apparatus of Israeli democracy, but it's a failure to build what the founders wanted to build, which was a society which would put the flourishing of the Jewish people at its very center. Uh, the easiest thing to do, I don't mean that we could do it, but you know, in, in, a, in a thought experiment, right? The easiest thing to do would be wave your magic wand and say, boom, there's no non-Jews in Israel then it's easy, er, at least. Uh, but that's never going to happen. We have 20% Arabs, and, um, and, and that's, I think, actually, in many ways, a wonderful thing, as it challenges us to be different than we would be if we were only among ourselves. Uh, but it's always going to be tricky to have a national anthem that speaks about 2,000 years of Jew Jewish yearning, nefesh yehudi homiya, and then expect an Israeli Arab justice on the Supreme Court to sing the national anthem at a national ceremony. Why would he do that? I mean, I'm saying he only because the two Arab, the Arabs on the Supreme Court happen to have been men so far. Hopefully they will come. We have a lot of women on the Supreme Court, but not Arab women yet. Uh, but why would he sing that anthem? He doesn't sing that anthem. And I understand it. And I applaud his decision not to do it. Should we have a second anthem in Arabic that doesn't speak about Jewishness, but that speaks about Israeliness? I don't know. I think that's an interesting conversation. We have a symbol of the menorah. That's the national symbol. That's much more value laden than an eagle, right? We have um, a Jewish star at the center of our flag. The flag's meant to look like a talit with those two stripes. Again, I think those are the tensions that are very, very real. I think we can work them out. Uh, I see no, I, the, the judicial reform thing, it seems to me, is not at all an issue between Judaism and democracy. But being an ethnic democracy, a liberal democracy, except that one specific ethnic group, in this particular case, Jews, does have primacy, that's always going to be really edgy. And that's always going to demand a, a tremendous amount of introspection and thought and dialogue. I think that'll make us better as a people and as a country if we embrace the challenge. If we just say, oh, I wish they weren't here, then we're just going to be, we're going to miss a huge opportunity to be better Jews, better human beings, better citizens. But if we embrace that challenge, I think it makes us a much richer society. So there aren't, I don't think, that many, and I'm not a, you know, political scientist, there aren't that many examples of ethno states, uh, ethnic democracies that are, um, you know, players, uh, um, players in the international stage treated with this, you know, afforded the respect that I think you and, and probably all of us want to see Israel treated. Um, how do you square that? Like, is that 
You know, I, mean, I, I, I actually that. can't think yeah, of another here. example. I think you're right. They're not a lot. I think there's one. I mean, there, there are other countries, by the way, where you have to be of a certain religion to be the monarch. Uh, in Scandinavian countries, you have to be a member of a certain church in order to be the monarch. Not that a lot of people really want to be the monarch of a Scandinavian country these days, but let's just say hypothetically, you know, if you were interested, you'd have to convert, or I don't know what you'd do. I've never really looked into it. But yeah, we're, we're, we're sui generis in that way. Okay. So we're the only one. Um, we're the only people that's been through a lot of things that we've been through. And we're the only people that's, that's given the world. We're the only people that gave the world the Hebrew Bible. And we're the only people that was exterminated as the world divided into two camps, the exterminators and those who allowed the exterminators to do their work. You know, we're just different and we're not better. We're just different. And we believe that we need a specific kind of a state in order to contribute to the flourishing of our people. Okay. So we're the only ethnic democracy out there. If we, if we comport ourselves in a way that takes human rights seriously and that takes the rights of citizens seriously, but we're not exactly like America, that I can totally live with. I mean, we all know that American democracy is not exactly blemish free, right? But, um, but if we comport ourselves in a way that many of the people at this very moment parading in the old city would want us to comport ourselves, then I would be ashamed of it. And I wouldn't have anything to say to my kids if they said, we're out of here. I would have no argument to make. Uh, but I don't believe that that's where we're going. I think that um, we have an ugly version of some specific for, form of Judaism on display these days. But I think the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people out in the streets on Saturday night do not represent that and find it anathema. And we're probably coming to some sort of a head in this conflict with the Haredim also. I think we're getting closer to a real conflict and we're going to have to have it out, which is exactly, by the way, to a certain extent, what the founding fathers of America did in Philadelphia in 1789. They knew from experience what wasn't working from 1776 to 1789. They decided we got to try something else. And they went to Philadelphia and they kept complete secrecy, by the way, complete secrecy to the extent there were no cell phones at all in the call. Um, but in any event, right, and nobody was allowed to talk about what was going on. And they created really an extraordinary experiment, very flawed, very blemished, but still unbelievably inspiring for the Western world. Um, I think we can do that. That's our challenge, to try to be unique, completely committed to human rights, civilian rights, citizen rights. Uh, but yeah, a place where the Jewish people, a place designed for the Jewish people to flourish. And the fact that you're, you're a thousand percent correct, there's no other country that does a similar kind of a thing. It's okay. Um, this is this part is not a question, but I, I, if you have a response, I'm happy to hear it, but then I'll move into a few other kinds of questions here. Um, you know, I think that, uh, I think you make the case in the book and obviously this will be familiar, a familiar line of, of critique to, to everybody here. Um, you know, the idea that why are we, why is Israel treated, um, in a way that's different from all other countries are treated. Uh, you know, I think if we're, if Israel is in fact different from all other countries, that might be something that we, we're, you know, need to expect, um, well, I would be very careful with that, though. I just want to say I would be, I would be very, very careful with that. I mean, I, I think the fact that we're different does not mean that we deserve the treatment that we get in the international community. I mean, Jews in America are different, too, right? They're just different. They're not Christian. They're not Muslim. They're not Sikh. They're different. Uh, but that doesn't justify people walking around Charlottesville saying Jews will not replace us. In other words, there's a there's difference and being the object of opprobrium are two very different things. And um, yeah, we're different, but the, the, the treatment of Israel in the international community has nothing to do with us being different. With Zionism being called racism in 1975 or taking over women's conferences of the UN in the 1970s and the 1980s and turning them into places where you gave out the protocols of the elders of Zion. And, and uh, that's not because we're different. That's because people hate Jews and why that hatred has persisted longer than any other hatred in the world I really can't tell you. I mean, why is there anti-Semitism in Japan when there's no Jews in Japan? Um, why, why, literally, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion sells like hotcakes in Japan. Go figure. Uh, but I actually, I don't want to say that, by the way, every criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. It's not. Israel can do stupid things, and we should be criticized for it. We've, we've conducted wars that were useless. Uh, Lebanon was kind of our Vietnam. And we have done all sorts of things that are terrible and France should be critiqued and Germany should be critiqued and Spain should and America should, but at the same level. And if we should, we should ask ourselves, why is it that we, I think are the, in, 
in terms of population, something like the 90th largest country in the world or something like that. But in terms of column inches, I don't know if you in the publishing world still speak in terms of column inches, but there was a day when we spoke about column inches. And in terms of column inches, if you include the Palestinian conflict, we're third in the world. And if you don't include it, leave the whole conflict out, we're still sixth. You know, where's Korea? Where's, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that this is not just because we're different. It's because we're Jewish and different. Um, so I just would be very careful at attributing all of that stuff to our difference. Absolutely uh, fair and appropriate. For anyone who's interested in Japan's fixation on the <laughs> Jews, we have robust reporting about that. I want to I dig in with you about Jewish criticism of Israel. Um, and, you know, I think you've historically been critical of American Jews who weigh in on Israeli politics and policy, um, particularly those who, who come to different conclusions from your own, but but also I think on principle <laughs> that like, that if you're not- yeah, If you don't agree with me, that, do not say that, right, exactly. <laughs> um, in February though, you joined with Yossi Klein Halevi, Mati Freeman to explicitly invite criticism of Israel's current government. Was that like a one-time offer or does that reflect a kind of a change in the way that you think about how American Jews talk about Israel? Well, I'll speak for myself, not for Yossi or Mati. Uh, we, we all had different agendas, I think, in writing the letter. We all wanted the letter to be a little bit different. We all compromised on certain things. Uh, I actually wanted the letter to have a different title. I wanted the title of the letter to be something like an open letter to the uh, the high, the, 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 you know, the leadership echelons of American Jewish community. I wanted to make it clear that the letter was addressed to people who were at the helm of all of the big organizations that you can think of, so that when they went into a private boardroom with their professional leadership, they could say, look, we got to say something. And here are these three people who are not lefties. I mean, call us whatever you want. None of the three of us are lefties. None of us are really right either. I mean, I really do think that we're all fairly center. And um, we've all been consistently saying that on most of Israel's internal domestic issues, you know, it's our country and we're going to have to figure it out. We're going to make mistakes and whatever. I'll come back to something else in a sec. But um, my agenda in that particular letter was because I felt, and this goes back to the period when we were really despondent and thought this might go through and thought the country was literally slipping through our fingers, just like kind of sand at the beach or water when you try to hold it from a bucket. It just, we watched it happening. I felt this was a sui generis moment uh, because um, it felt like Israel's fundamental survivability was at stake because of a mistake that we were making. And I felt that mostly Bibi, but not only Bibi, but mostly Bibi had really climbed up a tree and I didn't really care how he got down off the tree. I wanted him off the tree. And I wanted to give him every excuse possible to say to the people in his cabinet and his government, look, you know, I'm on your side, but... There's 270 economists who said, et cetera. Moody's and Bloomberg is downgrading us. Pilots are not training. And what if, you know, this American Jewish organization and that one and that one and that one all came out, we're going to lose them also. Now, Bibi might not personally care about that. I don't actually think that he does, but he should. And even if he doesn't care, he could have faked that he cared and used that. So my agenda in that one letter was to try to give the prime minister every possible way of getting down off the tree. Not that I had any illusion that he gave one little, you know, hoot about what, what I think. But I think also Yossi and Mati and I were animated by a sense. Everybody in this country is doing what they can. Like pilots are saying, I'm not going. Economists are publishing their thing. We're these three people. Y Yossi and I certainly are way too old to be doing reserve duty. I don't remember if Mati still does reserve duty or not. I don't know. But what could we do? We were asking ourselves really a very heartfelt question. We love this country. We raised our children here. We all moved here. Um, aside from, you know, beyond our family, we love this country, I think, more than we love anything in the world. And we're watching it self-destruct. What can we actually do? And there wasn't a lot that we could do, but we could actually say to American Jews, we want to embrace our partnership in this particular moment. We need you to speak out. We need you to understand that at this particular moment, to be opposed to the Israeli government is not to be opposed to the state of Israel. To support the state of Israel is to actually give the government some way of, you know, the fire, fire person putting the ladder up against the tree and letting, helping the cat get down or some, whatever, you know, metaphor you want to use. So I, is it a once in a life, once time thing? I, I don't see it as a major policy shift for the three of us. I don't think any of the three of us would see it that way. Uh, but we all felt that this was a critical and existential moment and by the way, we took a lot of heat from it for it. I mean, a lot, a lot of heat. 
Um, we got some we got some positive feedback too. Um, but I mean, you know, the 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 inboxes were just you know just you know overflowing. And people have the capacity to be rather expressive when they're writing emails. That's fine. Uh, we I took a lot of that myself. Yeah, no, I know that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but if you ever got into the publishing world, you know, then you would see it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we took a lot of heat. So what? Uh, that's okay. Um, I think in the past you've criticized. You know that you've been an open critic of of folks who maybe would have said, "I am bringing my criticism of the Israeli government and the state right now." out of love um and and you're and and that wasn't it wasn't received that way um and i've thought about this over time because you know on the one hand it makes sense to be debating the people who are most likely to listen and on the other hand like there's not as you point out in this book and in, in this conversation and elsewhere like there's not that many people who um really love israel are really deeply engaged with uh with it in all of its complexity and crucially have like the language and the, the um, you know, uh, familiarity with Jewish tradition to have a conversation on its own terms. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things I learned quickly when, when coming into this role was like, here are a couple like big blow ups. Um, here are some times where, you know, American Jewish leader criticized Israel out of love and, um and got took a lot of heat from folks who include you. Uh, and I'm curious if you have reflections on the costs and benefits of, of kind of doing so much dispate, debating or maybe even disparaging within this really small group of people who, who would all say, we love Israel and probably we identify as liberal Zionists, whatever that means, and we have a shared vision of what the ideal would be. Right. Okay, that's a very fair question. I mean, it's not a hard, it's not an easy question, not an easy question to answer, um, but it's a very fair question, and I appreciate the way that you put it. Uh, look, so look, first of all, I mean, I think I don't think I've actually been asked that question exactly like that ever before, and it's not something I've ever said this exact thing. Um, and I see the little recording thing at the top of my screen, so you know, I'm aware that this is a, a, not a private conversation. But there were certain things, you know. I think what was it that Nixon said when he got caught doing all things? You know, mistakes were made. You know, that was the um, and somebody called it, I think, the 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 passive explanatory, whatever it was. I mean, there's there there are there are columns that I wrote that I wouldn't write now, that I wouldn't. Um, and in certain cases, I've actually gone to the you know certain people and actually personally apologized. Um, so first, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I think I made mistakes, and I and I think that the heat of the heat, of, especially of certain moments of war here, uh, bring out. I mean, I just give you one example. I won't say the person who was it, it was addressed to, but there was there was. I wrote a column that was very sharp about somebody um, who had written a column about Israel. Um, a person who actually knows my kids, and um, literally five minutes before I read this person's column, somebody had sent me a photograph of my son um, in his army, you know, in his uniform with his rifle in what's called the, the you know, the, the, the gathering spot right outside Gaza where they put you before they send you in. Now, at that point, in that war, we didn't go in. But somebody had a little, this was before, before smartphones, but they had little cameras on these little flip phones. And somebody sent me a picture of my kid, another friend of his who knew me and sent it, whatever. Terrified. I mean, you terrified. And I was sitting there in my office thinking, you know what? He is there in that uniform with that gun on the border of Gaza because we decided at the age of 40, when we weren't going to have to do that, let's move to Israel. That'll be really profoundly meaningful. And I felt, you know, like really who, who gave us the right to do that to him? And I was consumed by that. And then I read this column and I just, I blew, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm not proud of it. I, I think that I, I, would, I would hopefully be, you know, it was 25 years ago or that we, that we came here and I don't know when that, that column came out, but a long time ago. And hopefully you learn something in life and you do things differently. So the first thing that I would say is, you know, I want to quote one of my most, you know, impressive Richard Nixon uh, and say, you know, mistakes were made. <laughs> but um, but to be more, you know, to be more to come out of the question, look, I think. I think that when one criticizes, one has to, first of all, remember. That criticism can take different forms. And it can be intermittent or it can be constant. 
So if we say I'm always criticizing my kid, but it's always out of love, but it's a, it's a, it's a barrage of criticism at every family dinner, every night, but I love you. That's why I'm doing this. Well, that doesn't count. In other words, that's just not, my kid has to hear, I love you and I'm proud of you for this and I'm proud of you for that. And I could never do that, that you just did because you're amazing. Um, then you can also say, yeah, but you probably shouldn't do X, Y, or Z, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I don't feel that. I don't feel that. And I've pointed, I've asked people to take, you know, certain obvious suspects and, and go on their Twitter feed, go on their Facebook pages and start looking for something positive that was said about Israel. And it's very hard to find. So uh, my teacher, Professor Seymour Fox of Blessed Memory, used to say, that's when I turn off my hearing aid. He wasn't talking about that issue, but he used that phrase. You know, that's when I turn off my hearing aid. I think a lot of Israelis have turned off their hearing aids. I'll give you another example. Two, in one case where I think American voices are critically important, and I was outraged by the, the Netanyahu government's decision to back off of the Kotel agreement. I mean, it was not going to go through anyway because he didn't have the votes without the Haredim. So, but he didn't show enough and anywhere near enough remorse and enough embarrassment about the fact that the state of Israel was backing through. He should have said, I can't make it happen. I can either lose my government and not have it happen or keep my government and not have it happen. So I'm going to keep my government, but I want you to know I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed we made a promise and we're not living up to it. It's not the relationship with the diaspora world that I would like. I would have been saddened by it, but I wouldn't have been enraged by it. But the the cavalier way in which he just kowtowed to the Haredim really enraged me. And there, when, when American Jews spoke out, I thought, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is about you. Um, and so speak up. But when you hear, for example, tremendous criticism, and I didn't see it this last couple of weeks, but maybe it was there, maybe it wasn't. It was also very quick. It was a five-day conflict. So maybe it just didn't gear up in time. But, you know, in 2014 and in 2021, um, if I was an American Jew who was about to criticize Israel out of love, as you say, one of the things that I might ask myself is, why is the Israeli left not criticizing the government? But Israeli progressives aren't really progressives. Israeli liberals aren't really liberals. Like, what am I missing? And I think what I might be a, a certain amount of um, humility, sort of epistemological humility, or a sense of, I don't know everything about what it feels to like to be there. Because if you're, the, the, the rockets hit progressives in the same way that they hit right-wingers. And progressives are sleeping on the cement floors of bomb shelters in the same way that centrists and right-wingers are, sleep, are sleeping on the floors of bomb shelters. And, um, you know, so if I would hope that if I were an American Jew and I was about to say what's going on in Gaza really just doesn't feel right, okay, it, does, well, it doesn't feel right to us either. I mean, it doesn't feel good. But what's, what's our alternative? Um, similarly, by the way, whenever I talk to American Jews about the conflict and, and the issue that comes up is the issue of, you know, the Palestinians, one of the things that I, I, you know, I'm struck by, it's the first topic that comes up in conversations with American Jews. I mean, almost, almost always it's the first topic. And I was just talking about this with my wife at dinner tonight. Um, it never comes up here. We just never, ever, 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 ever talk about it because we just don't know what to do. I mean, it's kind of like the gun issue or the race issue. I, most American Americans that I know do not want America to be a racist country. And most Americans that I know do not want people getting shot in malls, in parking lots, in schools, in sporting events, at concerts, and so on and so forth. But nobody knows what to do. And um, so when there is an outbreak, there's either a horrible racist moment or there's a, a gun tragedy. Of course, people talk about it. And if something were to happen here, people would talk about it also. But on an ongoing basis, this is, um, I mean, we all know people like this, and it's a horrible way to live, but it's chronic pain. And, and you just learn to live. I mean, anybody who's experienced chronic pain knows that it's debilitating, and it's hard to sleep, and it's hard to focus, and it's hard to enjoy anything. But you, you try to learn in some way to understand that it's there, and you still have to have relationships and try to enjoy things. And I think as a society, not having any idea what to do um, pulling out of the West Bank is obviously a complete non-starter because then the West Bank turns into the Gaza Strip and nobody has an, you know, uh, nobody knows what to do there. So it's a pain. It's a painful thing. It's very sad. It's grinding. None of, I think very few of us are oblivious to the real, real human suffering on the other side. I mean, I, I 
my friends are not oblivious. My students are not oblivious. People I go to shul with are not oblivious. We all understand that it's terrifying to be a Palestinian kid when our planes and helicopters come overhead. Uh, you know, when I have students, students who were, I, I forget what year this was, probably 2014, which was a big one. Uh, our students who were called up and sent into Gaza told us that they were sent back into Israel to go to sleep because the pounding of the bombs in Gaza was so incessant that the soldiers couldn't sleep. So I thought to myself, you know, first of all, how weird is it, right? Nobody sent anybody home from Vietnam to go sleep. I mean, it's just, you know, we don't have the luxury of fighting wars half across, half across the world. But I thought to myself when this, I remember who, who the student was who said that to me. Um, I thought, okay, I'm glad you got to go back. I really am glad you got to go back home and, you know, go to sleep somewhere. But those other people, they can't. And I think most of us understand that, that it's terrifying. And so I guess the, the criticism, the criticism is in place, I think at times, but I would actually ask again, if we're criticizing our spouse relentlessly, how much love gets felt? And if our spouse hears as much about why we love them and then the occasional criticism, because that's what a relationship is all about, fine. Um, but I would, I, would, I would want a certain amount of humility and asking people to ask themselves, well, why is the Israeli left not actually protesting this? And I'll come back to where I started. I would not write everything that I wrote. I would not say everything that I've said. Uh, I think we all should be growing human beings over the course of our lives and try to get a little smarter, a little bit more nuanced, learn about our own instincts more than we perhaps knew about them 20 years earlier. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the question because it's, uh, it's an important one. Thank you. And and you took us in a bunch of interesting directions there. Right at the at the end of our hour, um, I guess I would just I, I told you I was going to ask you a last question, but before we get to that last question, I'll ask one hopefully short, it won't be short, uh question before that. Um, you know, you you're taking us through this family dynamic kind of um conception of Israel and the diaspora. And I think that's useful. I mean, it's not like you invented it. That's in our tradition. Um, but but I think it's useful. And I think about that a lot, too, because, um, you know, for, for American Jews, whose vision of what it, who's, you know, the majority of American Jews, for example, want, uh, exp choose to practice Judaism in a way that isn't, right, isn't sanctioned by the, the Rabbanu, right, like, to take one example, right. um, and it makes it very hard. Right. There's a there's a we want if to the extent many of us who want to love Israel worry that Israel isn't loving us back. And I think that that's that's a real um, something that we could all explore in therapy. And I guess I'm, I'm I'm curious kind of what would be your prescription for how to have a better conversation moving forward? It sounds like you're optimistic that in some room right now, like the particular problem of this moment is getting hashed out. If that's hope. happening, we'll write about it on JTA when we learn about it. Um, but but it sounds like you're you're optimistic that we have a road forward. And so what would be your advice about having a, a healthier relationship and a healthier conversation? It's great. Um, look, when you say Israel doesn't love us back, the question is, what do you mean by Israel? And that's what I would, you know, Israel is not Bibi Netanyahu. And Israel is not the two chief rabbis. Uh, Israel is... The, the shul that I go to, which I guess you would call, or the three shuls that I go to, but two of the three are what you would call kind of egalitarian orthodox synagogues. And one just, you know, six o'clock in the morning on weekdays, who cares what it is? Because you're bleary eyed anyway. But um, so that's just a standard old fashioned orthodox synagogue. But but the other two places, which are really amazing communities, um, would embrace every single version of Judaism that feels unloved by Israel because they, not because they want to be that, because they understand it's part of the family. And again, you know, just like you said before, and I think completely correctly, yeah, maybe we're the only ethnic democracy in the world. We're the only country that really wrestles with what a real diaspora is like also. There's just no model for it. There's no, there's no prescription for what does a country do when it's designed to be, you know, contributing to the flourishing of particular people and X number, X percentage of that people chooses to care about it and not live there and Y percentage chooses not to care about it and not live there. You know, the French don't deal with it. The British don't deal with it. The Spanish don't deal with it. Um, and so we're, we're gonna have to figure this out also. And here I've been very critical of Bibi in previous times. Also, I think that 
he doesn't really care. I think he really doesn't care about American Jews. And I think it's a terrible mistake. His argument is, I don't need American Jews because there's more evangelicals between Los Angeles and Texas than there are Jews on the planet. So what do I need American Jews for? First of all, the evangelicals, the younger generation of evangelicals is not the same as the older generation. So you're wrong on the facts. But you need the American Jews to be part of your care because that's what this country is. The country is about the Jewish people, about all Jewish people. And they may choose to live here. They may not. They don't get to vote. That's true. They don't pay 52% taxes like some of us do. But... Um, but they're part of the Jewish people, and we really have to we really have to care. What I think I would say the prescription is look, I'm a conservative rabbi. Any wedding that I do in Israel is not recognized by the state. But do I do weddings in Israel? Yeah. And what do the couples do? Either they don't care if it's recognized by the state, like my kids who did not register their marriages with the state and are, you know, as far as the state is concerned, are just living together, which has no tax implications here. So there's really not, it's not a big deal. Um, or now the Supreme Court here has ruled that you can actually get married online in Utah from Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. So you can go home from your wedding that I did and then get married in Utah without going to an airplane. You can do that. Um, but there's there's hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands, but certainly many hundreds of weddings that are happening in this country that are not being performed by the Rabbanut or are completely halachic weddings that people are choosing not to go to the Rabbanut. There was an, there was an alternative kashrut um, path that Bennett's government had made possible. Of course, BB's government shut it down. But the mere fact that I know people, I didn't do this, but I think it's very honorable, people that would only eat in that kashrut thing, the alternative one. Um, you know, my favorite shawarma place didn't have it, so what am I going to do? Can't be all that principled. But, but, but I think there's a tremendous amount happening here that's much more embracing of American Jews than the prime minister or the chief rabbinate. And by the way, I mean, even in this government, Amichai Chikli, who's the minister for, for diaspora affairs, really, really cares. Actually, his father's a conservative rabbi living in Mexico. He actually really does care about the diaspora. He genuinely, I, mean, I know him, we're, we're friendly. He, he really does care. I don't agree with all of his politics, but he cares about it a lot. Uh, the fact that the Bennett government was so open to the diaspora in ways that are different from the previous Netanyahu government or the present one, uh, is a sign that there's there, that raw material is out there. There are plenty of Israelis who want a relationship with diaspora Jewry and American Jewry and non-Orthodox American Jewry. I wouldn't say when Israel doesn't love us back, I wouldn't say Israel doesn't love us back because Bibi and the rabbis don't love you back. A lot of us really do. And that's the, that's the Israel that American Jews should build a relationship with. The rank and file people here who are building amazing social organizations, amazing institutions, amazing synagogues. Um, uh, you know, by, just for example, I mean, today, for example, there's a very ugly thing going on in Jerusalem, even as we speak right now in the old city and whatever. But some of the people from one of these two synagogues that I mentioned, they were actually all over Facebook tonight here, bought tons of flowers and went right outside the old city and walked up to Arabs. And they were dressed clearly either in kippot or head coverings as women that made it obvious they were Jewish and religious and started giving flowers to people and having conversations with them. It's a pretty amazing thing. Like it's not going to stop the ugliness of the old city, but that's just as powerful. And those are the people that we should build relationships with. And those are the people that actually found, frankly need support. Um, there's a tremendous amount of beauty and love in this place also. And you don't have to go too far back in American history to hear an American government that was just spewing hatred in every possible direction. And it wasn't what America was. It was just what certain people in America were. Um, and they probably didn't love me so much either, or you, um, even though they wouldn't necessarily have said it. But that's not America. That's just some ugly people in America. And I would step right between the Israel that doesn't love us officially and the Israel that does want to embrace on the street. Thank you. And we have run over the time. I see questions about um, the allocation that's going from the from uh, Chickley's ministry to Jewish day schools in America. You again read about it on JTA. We don't know exactly where it's going to go, but um, the, Nobody the knows. Day, day school sector in the U.S. is excited about it and welcomes it despite you know, potentially having differences with the government overall. I want to thank you for a really great conversation that I think is leaving us with with lots more to think about. Um, I want to invite everybody here to continue to be part of the conversation by being in touch with us, with, for, you know, reading, obviously, our reporting, but but also 
um, to be in touch directly and we want to hear your questions and answer them. I did tell you I would ask you one last question. Um, so if you want to answer it, you can, you can, <laughs> but um, draft, draft title for the book you're going to release um, when Israel turns a hundred, what is that aspirational title that you, you hope you'll be able to write? Oh yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I really don't. I mean, my wife and I always have this conversation at the end of the day. Was that the last book? Was that the last book? And I always say yes. And she goes, no, you're such a liar. Um, I don't know if it is or it isn't. What I would love to write about 25 years from now, if I'm still writing anything or, you know, being around 25 years from now, um, is, that, you know, how we got through this. And it was a pivotal moment in us learning how to have serious conversations as a people. Maybe we would call it Turns out impossible was possible or something like that. I don't know. Uh, right now, you know, impossible is taking longer. Maybe impossible is really possible. I don't know. But I'll tell you this. I think that um, conversations like this are, are really super important. And it's the rare person who can um, engender a conversation like this the way that you have. So I feel very grateful to you, um, both for the invitation and to Taya for the invitation, but to you for conducting this conversation the way that you have. I think it really leaves me thinking about a lot of things that I hadn't perhaps thought about in quite the same way before. And that's a real gift. Um, so much more important than whatever book might or might not come out in 25 years is the conversation that we all have with each other over the course of that time. And I think here you've really set a phenomenal example and I'm grateful to you for it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everybody.